There's a lot of focus on cheating in the world of chess right now after world champion Magnus Carlsen accused 19-year-old Grandmaster Hans Niemann of cheating against him at the 2022 Singfield Cup. For those of you not deeply familiar with the game, cheating at the professional level of chess is probably different from what you're imagining. You're not going to see people swiping pieces off the board or trying to get away with illegal moves outside of amateur games and really bad fiction. By far the most common and powerful way to cheat is receiving computer assistance as we've long passed the point where man can compete with machine at the game. The players on this list were all powerful enough students of the game to officially earn the title of master. Their envoys expected to uphold its honor, especially at their level where a Morse code buzzer too can make a world of difference. So without further ado, here are 10 chess masters who were caught cheating. Let's get Hans Moke Niemann, the 19-year-old American Grandmaster peaking at an ELO of 2699 out of the way because he's on everyone's mind right now and will command a plurality of the video. Regarding his now infamous game against Magnus at the 2022 Singfield Cup, no, it hasn't been proven that Hans cheated in that game. But he's unquestionably on this list because he has admitted to cheating as recently as three years ago as part of the sordid contextual history brought to the forefront from that Carlsen match. Understand that long before any public accusations were made, there were whispers among the professional circuit with suspicions of Mr. Neiman cheating. Like Hans, but I think Hans is sitting on his 3000, like uh, he should uh, like picture, he should screenshot this and uh, like pray, pray for this elo. And how do you guys think in general if Hans is always playing himself or he's using uh, a bot? Because I believe like, you know, few, 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 few games like, uh, especially when he's streaming or he's playing against someone, someone known like me or Hikaru or someone else, uh, he's commonly playing himself, but um, in general when the stream is offline, I have a very strong feeling that sometimes he's uh, like, He's improving. He's improving. Those whispers proved accurate. The Hans Niemann report released by Chess.com, which we'll get to more on soon, confirms that by 12 August 2020, their Fair Play team, which is the gold standard for detecting the illegal use of computer assistance in chess games, determined that Hans had cheated in at least 112 games of the 2,170 he had played under the name I am Hans Niemann, notably including every game he played in a seven-game blitz series against Nepomniachtchi himself. The report actually appears to have its dates wrong, by the way. Hans didn't play a seven-game series against Nepo on June 20th. On that day he played a six game series against him in which he only won once. I'm almost certain that the report actually meant to refer to their seven game series on 8 June, the first time the two played on the site. Here Hans crushed Nepo thrice in a row with a sky high 96% accuracy before coming down to earth in game 5. More tellingly, their seventh game abruptly ended after one move as a loss by resignation for Hans. Any chess.com veteran knows that this is what it looks like when an account is flagged in real time for recent engine use. No wonder Nepo couldn't help mentioning his suspicion of Hans cheating aloud. For Forgive the aside, but I seem to be the only one who noticed this discrepancy, and when am I ever going to talk about this again? Anyway, Chess.com quietly banned Hans Niemann on 11 August after a Title Tuesday event and resolved to confront him privately. Danny Wrench, chief customer officer at Chess.com, communicated with Hans over Slack and phone call to offer Hans a generous reprieve, something Chess.com apparently gives any player dedicated enough to be titled, especially young ones. Confess to cheating privately, and Chess.com will do the following. Keep the cheating matter confidential, allow Hans to close the account himself so it wouldn't have the typical fair play violation that denotes a cheater, allow Hans to start a new count under the guise of doing so voluntarily, and eventually even allow Hans to return to competing in their monetarily prized events. Hans accepted, admitting to cheating both in their private phone call and Slack correspondence and making the new Hans on Twitch account. That's already enough to earn a place on this list because Hans was already an international master by the time he cheated. But we need to dive a little deeper on Hans and the Hans Niemann report to provide context on his present situation and ongoing lawsuit. The Niemann report doesn't state this outright, but it can be inferred that when Chess.com confronted Hans, they were doing so solely about his then recent play in their August 11 title Tuesday. Why is that important? Fast forward to 2022, a day after Magnus alluded to accusing Hans of cheating. This was actually also a day after Chess.com privately banned Hans again, which we didn't know until this interview, where Hans stated the following. So first of all, there's the the situation with Chess.com. Now people have uh, there have said that my Chess.com was was banned twice. Okay, so this is what happened. When I was 12 years old, I was uh, with a friend and I was playing Title Tuesday. Came over on an iPad with an engine, and I, I was 12 years old, and he said, you know, uh, uh, he started giving the moves. I was a child. I had no idea what happened. This happened once in, in, in an online tournament. I was just a child and nothing happened then. Four years later, when I was 16 years old during my streaming career in an absolutely ridiculous mistake in unrated games. After that, I had when other when I was 12, I've never ever in my life cheated in an over the board game in an online tournament 
they were an unrated game. Now that Chester Com has suddenly decided to hop on Magnus's uh, insinuations, Hikaru's very direct accusations, now they see the opportunity, okay, we're just gonna get rid of this. I believe that this is completely unfair. This is a targeted attack. When Chester Com sends you this email, did they give a reasoning? No reason. They sure. just informed you. They just, no reason. They said, I, I, I tried to log in my Chess.com account. I couldn't log in. Sending me an email. A few hours later, they have rescinded your, we have privately, so they didn't want to ban me publicly because then they have to give a reason. And they think that they can scare me because they think that I'm not going, that I'm not going to talk about it because I'm afraid to admit this. Those accusations, coupled with Hans talking publicly about his private correspondence with Chess.com, were what prompted the creation of the Hans Niemann report in the first place. Hans likely miscalculated when he made these statements, incorrectly believing that the few Title Tuesday games that prompted his ban were the only ones that could be proven to be cheated. But his absurd level of play in some of these other games, especially against GM Krikor, whom he demolished with only one loss over 16 games in a Blitz series, was undeniable. So with the Hans Niemann report exposing that Niemann did in fact cheat in prize money games, did in fact cheat in streamed games, and did in fact cheat more than 100 times on the site, all contradictory to that interview, the microscope on Hans zoomed only further in. Not helping matters was that the report found Hans rising over the board strength to be extremely unusual for his age. And that was pretty rough for Hans, because before the report even dropped, he had to deal with boundless exposition on his poor post-game analysis of his own play against Magnus the day of, the circumstance of one of his mentors being a proven cheater who will feature on this list, the accusation of Hans using an insertion to cheat, which went viral, microanalysis of his walking gait by large content creators, and microanalysis of cherry-picked games by FM Yosha Iglesias, somewhat unfairly dubbing him Mr. 100%, that is correlative with engine play. The statistics don't actually indicate Hans having strong engine correlative play at all since August of 2020, and Hans stated he'd be more than willing to play in the nude to prove he's not a cheater. I think he genuinely means that, and it would attract a whole new audience to chess if nothing else. But ultimately, Hans isn't banned from competing on any circuit or sanctioned by FIDE, the international chess federation at all. Given his youth, this might very well have been a recoverable situation, until perhaps he filed a $100 million lawsuit alleging Carlson, GM Hikaru Nakamura, and Chess.com staff all engaged in a conspiracy to defame him and ban him from the global competitive chess industry. All defendants have filed motions to dismiss, but regardless of how the case pans out, Neiman's career has likely ended by ostracization at the tender age of 19. Gaios Nagaladze was a 25-year-old grandmaster peaking at an ELO of 2566 from the country of Georgia, with an impressive resume that included winning the Georgian Championship in 2013 and 2014, the latter despite being only an international master among a 12-player round robin with 8 grandmasters above him. His most notable win was the 2014 Alain Open, where he blew away 3 GMs rated above 2600 despite being a 28th seed with an ELO of 2500. The only player to score a win against him along the way was Tigranel Petrosian, who, according to the rumor mill, was already suspicious of Gaios's tendency to overperform since he won that 2014 Georgia Championship. Petrosian noted Nagalidze's tendency to frequently use the restroom, but didn't raise the issue after beating him. But the two would meet a year later at the 2015 Dubai Open, where Nagalidze was doing quite well, winning four or five matches thus far. Yet again, Nagalidze was showing the same pattern, promptly making a move after Petrosian's own and literally running to the toilet right afterward. Petrosian decided to test Nagalidze on moves 15 and 22 by making quick moves after Nagalidze's own, such that it would have been insane to use the restroom again. These two moves were Nagalidze's only inaccuracies in the game. Petrosian Petrosian finally reported him, an arbiter followed him to the bathroom to check him and found nothing, and a panicked Nagalidze went to the same stall on the very next move. This time, security checked the stall he kept using itself, and found an iPod touch and headphones hidden under toilet paper behind the garbage bin. Nagalidze denied it belonged to him and denied cheating, but the iPod was logged into a social media account of his and had the exact position of his game against Petrosian being analyzed by a computer. It yielded some humorous pictures, my personal favorite of all pictures of chess cheating being this one. Needless to say, the arbiters were not convinced by Nagalidze's denial. He was disqualified from his game against Petrosian and removed from the tournament. Eight months of investigation later, Fide stripped him of his Grandmaster title, reduced him to International Master, and banned him for three years. This was somewhat historic. It was the first instance of a punishment for cheating since Fide's establishment of an anti-cheating committee, and to that point it was the harshest punishment for cheating they had ever doled out. The incident cemented Nagalidze's departure from chess and Petrosian's reputation as a stalwart man of honor against cheating. Tigran Levani Petrosian was an Armenian Grandmaster peaking at 2671 who was 36 at the time of his incident. Yes, this is the same hero from the last story, and yes, the L for his middle initial is very important. In the finals of the Chess.com 2020 Pro Chess League, a teamed online event with a grand prize of 20,000 USD. El Petrosian led the Armenian Eagles to victory against the St. Louis Archbishops with an astounding three wins, one draw, no losses, and four rapid time control matches against GMs with ratings 100 points above his own, including beating then world number two Fabiano Caruana. Spectators noticed that during all of El Petrosian's matches, he would frequently look down at something off camera. When asked about how he performed so well against a team full of super GMs, Petrosian ascribed his success to drinking gin of all things. Tigran.
I mean, you were the hero today. What did you eat for breakfast? What, what have you been doing? <laughs> How did you score three and a half out of four against such a monstrous lineup? Actually, uh, during the match, I was drinking the gin before <laughs> all the time. So, as usual, you guys should know how I'm playing. But two days after the tournament, Wesley So, one of the super GMs he beat, expressed skepticism toward that explanation and responded to a fan on a chess.com article's comment section with the following. Yeah, Petrosian played better than Magnus Carlsen yesterday. I need to have some of that secret gin also. I wonder what happened to the Eagles' top scorers, Andre Asian and Shant Sargsian. Why they don't play on chess.com anymore, winky face. We want to have an over-the-board rematch. LOL, just kidding. Anyway, I think the final should have had proctoring. Lots of work were at stake, and weeks of playing through the qualifying phase. By the way, if you're wondering about the two GMs so mentioned, Zavin Andriasian and Shant Sargsian, they indeed haven't played on Chess.com since 22 April 2020, and were most likely privately confronted by staff the way a young Hans Niemann was for his first ban. But I won't include them on this list. I'll link their game histories in the description for you to decide. That aside, Tigran El Petrosian saw this and responded in the comments section with an unbelievable reply that is easily the funniest copy pasta chess has and ever will have it reads are you kidding what the are you talking about man you are a biggest loser i ever seen in my life you was doing pp -pee in your pampers when i was beating players much stronger than you you are not professional because professionals know how to lose and congratulate opponents. You are like a girl crying after I beat you. Be brave, be honest to yourself, and stop this trush talkings. Everybody know that I am very good blitz player. I can win anyone in the world in single game. And quotation mark W S Lee quotation mark S so is nobody for me. Just a player who are crying every single time when losing. Remember what you said about Faruja? Stop playing with my name. I deserve to have a good name during whole my chess carrier. I am officially inviting you to OTB Blitz match with the prize fund. Both of us will invest 5,000 USD and winner takes it all. I suggest all other people who's interested in this situation, just take a look at my results in 2016 and 2017 Blitz World Championships, and that should be enough. No need to listen for every crying babe. Tigrin Petrosian is always play fair. And if someone will continue officially talk about me like that, we will meet in court. God bless with true. True will never die. Leers will kicked off. But Wesley So was somehow staunch in the face of Petrosian's intimidating tirade, mustering the courage to reply three times. First writing, you got yourself a deal, man, anytime, anywhere, as long as there is proctoring. He even more brazenly added, and I thought you were educated. We should probably report you also to FIDE or ACP, considering that online games can account for over the board also. Can you please explain to us why you keep looking down at the same place on the live video stream? He concluded, well, I just want to congratulate you for performing well over 2,900 in the PCL playoffs. Scoring three and a half out of four against Sakaro's team, the New York Marshals, and decimating them, given you did have his Avenandri Asians help back then. Scoring three and a half out of four against the Archbishops, with a 2760 plus average FIDE rating. You are clearly the king of the online chess, man but I will dare fight you over the board. Unfortunately, before El Petrosian could deliver another presumably awe-inspiring reply, Chess.com found that Tigran did in fact cheat in his matches against So's team and in his semi-final matches against the horribly named Canada Chess Bras. They disqualified the Armenian Eagles from the tournament, named the Archbishops the victors, redistributed the prize money, and permanently banned El Petrosian from their website with a fair play violation notice. Very rare for them to give to a title player. El Petrosian responded to the whole ordeal on 3 October, when the Armenian Eagles held a press conference wherein he and team manager Artek Manukian repeatedly affirmed their innocence, further claiming that Chess.com simply wanted the Americans to win. In a solo Russian interview with Chess News a day later, Petrosian claimed Chess.com refused to address the lengthy counter-arguments he sent to them and refused to engage him any further. Better yet, he repeatedly affirmed his desire to punch Wesley So in the face. Well, if the Blitz series for $5,000 is never happening, that boxing match would definitely be the next best thing. This incident certainly cast a bit of a different light on Petrosian's vigilantism against Nagaladze, and it would be the impetus and stricter rules for online chess matches of this nature, such as having multiple cameras. With all, this time for sure, the guy on the other end of this whole ordeal would never be someone to find himself on the wrong side of the chess rulebook. Wesley Barbosa So Alright, this incident really doesn't belong on this list. It's controversial and not at all underhanded. But if you count anything that's intentionally and repeatedly breaking the rules, especially resulting in disqualification, to be cheating, then this incident technically counts. I also want to acknowledge my bias to the contrary. So is my favorite chess player. I think he's the best ambassador for the game America has ever had. Sorry, Hikaru. But I wanted to include this incident for discussion because it happened before chess gained the popularity it has today and could be a good learning point if nothing else. Anyway, Wesley So is an American Grandmaster, formerly a Filipino nationality who has peaked at a monstrous 28-22 ELO rating. At the 2015 US Chess Championship, so was disqualified from his round 9 match opposite GM Verujan Akobian after just 6 moves. His offense? He wrote a motivational message that read, double check, triple check, 
use your time to himself on a piece of paper under the official score sheet. In real time, it wasn't clear to the community what happened, some even thinking he resigned until clarification arrived. Guys, in one of the most stunning developments ever in the history of U.S. chess, Wesley So has played just about five moves, six moves, uh, and resigned. He resigned against Ferrugian Akobian. We are trying to figure out what's going on. Akobian is mystified. Just incredible development here in the U.S. Championship. Wesley So has resigned the game. However, once his violation became known, debate abound over whether the punishment fit the crime. Note-taking of any kind is illegal under FIDE rules, but writing positive notes to yourself isn't the rarest behavior in chess, especially for So. And it's certainly rare to see it result in a violation of any kind. But here, So had already been given multiple warnings throughout the tournament. In round one against Daniel Naroditsky, So wrote, use your time, you have a lot of it, for which he received no official warning, but an informal one and reminder of the rules from Arbiter Tony Rich. In round two against Sam Shankland, So wrote, sit down for the entire game, never get up. He received an official warning from Rich and complied with the instruction to cross out the note. In round three against Samuel Sevian, So wrote again but crossed it out so well that its content wasn't recoverable. Tony Rich gave him a second official warning and told him that he would forfeit his game the next time he did so. And that's what happened when So repeated the practice in round nine against Sokobian, albeit not on the official score sheet. So wasn't disqualified from the tournament and actually wound up finishing third. He didn't take it well at the time though, opining that Akobian was employing gamesmanship and just wanted the free feed A points. Yeah, I mean I, I can understand why for not wanting to play again. Do you think he didn't want to play you, or what uh, you well, obviously that? he wanted a free point. He, you think he just wanted the free point? Yeah. Wow, that's a that's a big claim. He said you guys are teammates and friends. Well, we were. This drew rebuke from others in the chess community, and Akobian seemed remorseful about the ordeal when the game was over. I feel really bad for Wesley. He's a friend, and you know he's been with us to the team tournaments. You know, I've trained with him, so I mean, it's feel really bad for Wesley, but. Uh, uh, you know, I hate to say, but this might be a, uh, maybe a good lesson just to make sure that, you know, you have to follow the rules. So tried to appeal the loss of rating points, not the loss itself, but was unsuccessful. Ultimately, this was an unfortunate storm of circumstance. I don't think Akobian knew So would lose the entire game when he reported the practice. I don't think So was in the right frame of mind. He was only 22, this was his first appearance at the US Chess Championships, and he was visibly stressed throughout the tournament. And I think Tony Rich made a mistake. One option available to him was deducting time from So's clock instead of an outright game forfeiture. In my opinion, that's a more logical progression, would have driven home the seriousness of the situation to So, and we would have had a very interesting game of seeing whether So could hold his own with a handicap. Again, all of So's messages to himself were benign, so this incident doesn't fit the unscrupulous nature of the word cheating, but it's still worth including as a cautionary tale, if nothing else. At this insanely high level of chess, it's a game of inches, or perhaps millimeters, and minutia can be the difference between victory and defeat. Banning note-taking of this kind ensures your opponent can't use gamesmanship to distract you with something like a subtle insult. There's still myriad discussion to be had on it. At the time, I argued that it's no different from wearing an article of clothing with a motivational message on it, like a Livestrong wristband. But I'd like to hear your guys' thoughts. Were you expecting a Cobian? Let's break the chain with something just as humorous. Imagine you meet a guy for the first time and you get the first few curriculum by table, it's about his life. You learn that he's a 50 year old former mayor of a town in Northern Italy and that he's a FIDE master in chess, speaking at an ELO of 2389. You'd be impressed, right? Well, don't judge a book by its cover or in Laura Sarita's case, his blurb. In the span of a mere two years and in his ripe late 40s, Sarita experienced a very statistically unusual boom in his playing abilities, jumping over 200 points in ELO from the low 2000s to the mid 2200s. He had suddenly surged to the level of a local Kasparov, as his peers put it, and that attracted attention. And under that attention, the unfortunate truth of his Cinderella story came to light. Three games into a tournament in January of 2013, the Arbiters inspected Sarita's attire and determined that he was hiding a small earpiece under his hair, and the dark glasses he was wearing for all three games were fitted with a small camera. The Italian Chess Federation determined that he was using this setup to get assistance from a buddy with a computer, and summarily banned him, making him the first person they ever banned. Unfortunately, because they were local, we can't see the PGM of those games. But amusingly, his primary political rival, the left-wing Rosa Pallone and then president of Bukinasco's town council, took the opportunity to rub salt in Sarita's self-made wound with the following statement. Sarita claims he's very good at chess, but it seems even that's not true. And with the bribery case, he appeared to be caught red-handed, but he still denied it. It's almost as if it's accepted that an official will profit from his position. These things are scandalous, but people are no longer shocked by them. What she's referring to is that at the time, then-mayor Sarita was on trial for bribery when CCTV captured him accepting a 
bag of 10,000 euros, a bribe to greenlight the construction of a car park, also accepting two Ferraris and a Bentley from the mob. The town of Bukinosco has a reputation for being in the pocket of the mafia, and Sarita did little to abate that during his tenure as mayor. Sarita denied any cheating. He claimed the earpiece was a hearing aid and the camera was inactive. When the matter went to local court months later, Sarita didn't contest the charges, but immediately appealed. And in appellate court, it was ruled that there wasn't enough evidence to justify the ban, which some speculated is because Sarita had the favor of the judges at that level. With all, he probably wrote to Chessbase.com in 2018 that, Actually, my only fault was to consider the accusation so foolish as to not present any defense to the first court. Amazing, this court, without any proof, declared me guilty. Then at the appeal level, I demonstrated that nothing was true in the accusation package. The games themselves were totally outside any assisted performance play. The glasses were a well-known model with LED light, used to read in the night. Finally, the three accusers, when asked about the color of the alleged earphones, declared three different versions. In the end, four months after the ban, I returned to tournament play, simply demonstrating my strength. You can easily check it on my FIDE profile. You might argue that that's enough to exclude him from this list, but not in my eyes. If you show a statistically extraordinary improvement at chess in old age, you have the type of character that can be bought by the mob as mayor, and you get caught in real time with equipment to cheat insofar as you're the local area's first ban, I'm comfortable calling you a cheater. Is that proof beyond a reasonable doubt? No, but this is a YouTube video, not a murder trial. It's also interesting to me that Mr. Sarita's chess.com profile shows he stopped playing on the site for two years after showing some ridiculously strong tournament play and only returned recently, especially now that we know what we do about how their team handles certain matters. But that just underscores the problem with selective secrecy. It always causes speculation. Igor Srausis was a 58-year-old Grandmaster from the Czech Republic peaking at a FIDE rating of 2694.5. When Rausis was caught cheating at a tournament in Strasbourg, France on 12 July 2019, it was at once three things, disheartening, unsurprising, and chess's most infamous story. It was disheartening because as a Grandmaster since 1992, Igor Srausis was the oldest top 100 player in the world, ranked 53. His career trajectory was a defiance of the inexorable stagnation Father Time visits upon all chess players, who usually begin to decline after 40. Rausis demonstrably plateaued around 2,500 ELO since ratings were publicly tracked in 2003, all the way until June of 2013, when he experienced a sudden but steady growth to 2,686 by the time of his ban in July 2019. To improve by 200 points over six years at the master level is incredible at any age, but it was theretofore unheard of for one to do in his 50s. It was unsurprising, however, for much the same reason. The six-year trend line alone raised eyebrows, but this monumental jump of 30 points in two months had fellow grandmasters counting the days until his ban. Even more alarm sounding than mere treadlines, though, was how Rouses transparently gamed the system to increase his ELO rating. At the time, Rule 8.54 of the FIDE Handbook stated that a difference in rating of more than 400 points shall be counted for rating purposes as though it were a difference of 400 points. In other words, if a 2600 rated GM beat a mere 1200 novice, it would be treated as though they had just beaten a 2200 rated player, garnering 0.8 points for the victory. Rouses exploited this rule by almost exclusively entering small, low-level, but still FIDE certified tournaments where the player base was usually 1400 to 20 2100 in strength. In the world of role-playing video games, we call that farming. Humorously, by the next FIDE handbook after Rouses got banned, the rule would be amended. The 2022 version states that it only applies for one game in a tournament, the highest rating differential a player encounters. I'd like to call that the Rouses rule. Anyway, Rouses still couldn't guarantee that he wouldn't draw a sufficiently strong player who could reduce his Evo with a tie. But it just so happens that Rouses would take an unusual number of bathroom trips against highly rated opponents. And that brings us to why Rouses's case was the most infamous. This picture. This was the image of chess cheating until the Neiman scandal. At the 2019 Strasbourg Open in France, Rousses was caught mid-game, pants down, or pants up rather, sitting on the toilet on his smartphone. Tournament officials found the phone in the stall after one of his breaks earlier in the match, but wanted to definitively prove to whom it belonged, as all electronics were forbidden. Now, many of you seeing this for the first time will probably have the same concerns raised at the time the story broke. Isn't this a privacy violation? No word was ever given on whether the photographer faced repercussion, and I doubt it, because Rousses probably didn't argue it. Unlike most players on this list, the moment he was caught, he admitted guilt, telling Chess.com within a day, I simply lost my mind yesterday. I confirmed the fact of using my phone during the game by written statement. What could I say more? Yes, I was tired after the morning game and all the Facebook activity of accusers also have a known impact. At least what I committed yesterday is a good lesson. Not for me. I played my last game of chess already. This was after FIDE Director General Emil Satovsky took to Facebook the day of, 11 July 2019, writing, Igor Rousis was caught with the police at a tournament at Strasbourg. Thanks to Laurent Fried and Yuri Garrett for leading the capture of a long suspected player and the tournament referees who followed all all the instructions clearly. Rousis's catch is just the first swallow. 
It is impossible to completely eradicate cheating, but the risk of being caught has increased significantly. The comment section of that post turned into a veritable who's who of fellow chess masters weighing in on their experiences with Rousus, with Grandmaster Keith Arknell stating that he had called Rousus getting caught just five days before it happened. I told Danny Gormley five days ago that Rousus would be caught very soon. The <coughs> got too greedy, accelerated his BS too rapidly. Typical criminal behavior. They get greedy. Me and Rousus were always about equal in strength, then suddenly at a tournament in Sunningdale, England, he beat me brilliantly with a three-piece sacrifice. Something didn't feel right. After this, I collapsed completely despite starting with a win against a very strong player. I guess there are many other players whose tournament he ruined. I hope it's a life ban. And indeed, looking back at the PGN of the game in question with the benefit of hindsight, it's unreal. Would any human dare to play knight takes on f7 here in a classical time control against a 2400 grandmaster? You could practically smell the oil from that engine. Although Arknull misremembered that the game was actually the last of the tournament, his point about the mental devastation such a drumming would inflict on a master is really important. Cheating in chess has to direct victims, and not just for one game. Rousus was stripped of his Grandmaster title, reduced to IM, and banned from playing for six years. But he has the funniest epilogue of anyone on this list. See, Rousus wasn't exactly honest when he said he played his last chess game. On 11 October 2020, just a year later, GM Artis Neekson spotted Rousus playing in a prize tournament that was actually a memoriam to Neekson's deceased coach, Sevalad Suzinskis. Infuriated, he confronted Rousus after round two, who had begun wearing a mask after people started recognizing him in round one. When confronted, Rousus revealed he had legally changed his name to Issa Kasimi, complete with a new passport. The tournament wasn't a FIDE one, so they had no power to ban him, but Kasimi decided to politely leave when asked to by the tournament director. The name change was actually to avoid discrediting his ex-wife, whom he's on good terms with, too. God bless. Ernesto in Arkiv is a Russian grandmaster who has peaked at a FIDE rating of 2732. In round one of the World Blitz Championship on 29 December 2017, he held the black pieces against Magnus Carlsen and was rated nearly 400 points below him in Blitz time controls. By the end game, Carlsen was well on his way to victory. In this position, he had 18 seconds on his clock to in Arkiv 6, albeit with a two second increment. He played rook takes b7, which puts the black king in check and sees white up by almost three points when the dust settles. More than enough to win comfortably at this stage. How did in Arkiv respond? Knight to e e7 after spending a good moment contemplating the board. The move would put Carlsen's white king in check, but is completely illegal for failing to resolve the check on Inarchiv's black king. Carlsen fails to realize this and instinctively moves his own king to safety with king d3. The moment Carlsen played it, Inarchiv pointed out the illegality, stopped the game, and called for the arbiter. Inarchiv argued that after he made his own illegal knight move, Carlsen had only one legal option, claiming the game right then and there. By not doing so, Inarchiv argued, Carlsen himself made an illegal move, permitting Inarchiv to claim the game instead, and the arbiter on scene agreed, awarding the game to Inarchiv. This is definitely a situation where even if you know nothing about chess, you know something's wrong with that. If Carlsen's going to lose for making an illegal move, shouldn't Inarchiv lose for making an illegal move first, especially when his caused Carlsen's own? Carlsen quickly appealed to the chief arbiter, who at first overturned the game to a draw before ruling that the game should continue from the new position. He cited articles A.4.2 and A.4.4 as Inarchiv protested hard, yielding this briefly infamous image. FIDE director Satovsky chimed in on Facebook again to transcribe the conversation that took place. I couldn't find the audio, but here's my favorite portion of it. Because I think when my king is under attack, he cannot make king d3. He can make. This is not a legal move. You said king d3 is a legal move. He made a move. The previously illegal move stands. He didn't claim for a legal move. But I claimed. Claim for what? Your illegal move? No, claim for his illegal move. The move he played was legal. Not legal. Yes. You said in that position king d3 is a possible move. Yes. It's like an Abbott and Costello sketch. Anyway, the rules for moving pieces are different and more complex in faster time controls owing to the prevalence of human error. And after this game in 2018, the rules of blitz and rapid chess were amended. Now if the arbiter sees a position where both kings are in check, the arbiter must wait for the completion of the next move. If an illegal position remains on the board, the game is a draw. Also, warnings and penalties are given for the first illegal move, and only if a player makes illegal moves twice will the arbiter declare the game a loss for him or her. If you ask me, the easier way to rectify it would be to simply allow capturing the opponent's king instead of forcing continuation. Carl Carlsen won the game when Inarchiv refused to continue, but was certainly thrown off and underperformed for the rest of the day. But in classic Magnus fashion, he stormed back on day two to claim the title. And as for Inarchiv, he experienced no repercussion, and you might say it's unfair for me to call him a cheater and put him on this list. And you'd be in good company. Nicolopoulos agrees, stating the following. So I read uh, some opinions on Facebook, on social media. People were accusing Inarchiv that... Uh... He was cheating. He made all this on purpose in order to win a lost position. In my opinion, uh, he didn't cheat, of course. I believe that uh, he had misunderstood this loss of chess about Rapid. And I think uh, many players, many top players, don't understand correctly all these laws.
But I look at how long in Arkeev took to make his illegal move, how quickly he called out Carlson failing to see it, how sly his temperament was immediately after the match, his acknowledgement that the position was lost for him, and his refusal to accept a draw is telling. I believe in Arkeev knew he was losing, so he did something illegal to try to win. And that's the definition of cheating. At number three on our list, we fittingly have three masters, GM Sebastian Feller, GM Arnaud Hotchard, and I am Ciro Marzolo, who are all in the same conspiracy to cheat. Before Rousis was Chess's most notorious example of cheating, these three gentlemen held that title. They were the strongest players ever to be found cheating at the time and were the first high-profile example of masters cheating at chess. It also stood out as an applause-worthy example of a country holding its own players to intense scrutiny to suss out cheating. That doesn't happen often in any sport. At the 39th Chess Olympiad that took place from 19 September to 4 October 2010, in Kanti Mansisk, Russia, featuring 144 different countries, Sebastian Feller was the youngest member of the French team at 19. He was known as something of a prodigy after he won the 2010 Paris Championship with an astonishing rating performance of 28.59 and 8 out of 9 points won. Arnaud Hotchard was a team captain, not directly playing himself. Feller had another excellent performance at the Olympiad, finishing with 5 victories in 9 games and being awarded a gold medal for the best individual performance on board 5. The other four members of the team, Maxime vestier legrave Laurent Fresenet, Vladislav Tkachev, and Romain Edward had no role in the cheating whatsoever. Ciro Marzolo wasn't part of the team. He was all the way in Nancy, France at the time. Under financial duress, he had been given a job by Joanna Pomian, then the vice president of the French Chess Federation. She turned out to be the chief hero of the story. Pomian had been suspicious of Feller since at least his 2010 Paris Championship victory and knew he had a close relationship with Marzolo. On 27 September, Marzolo was at Pomian's residence for work. Feller was live in a match opposite Robert Kreisel, and Marzolo accidentally left his phone in the same room as Pomian when she saw it alight with a text from Hartridge number that read hurry up, send moves. Respecting privacy, Pomian didn't investigate the phone further and instead advised Jean-Claude Moyt, then the president of the French Chess Federation who was president at the Olympiad, to pay close attention to Hotchard for any evidence of cheating. Moyt wasn't able to catch him red-handed, but affirmed that Hotchard made very frequent trips in and out of the playing area to check his cell phone as well as Feller's, then make odd movements around the team's table when he returned. Security wasn't checking personnel for cell phones upon entry and re-entry to boot. Now, the phone in Marzolo's possession was actually a business phone paid for by Pomian, so she did have access to all its SMS records. On 30 September, she verified that Marzolo had sent Hotchard over 200 text messages, usually without answer, and exclusively when Feller was in game. But she stopped short of looking at the texts themselves until she consulted legal advice. Still, it was enough for her and Moyt's conscience. In the absence of concrete evidence, and knowing Russia's history of turning foreigners who commit the most minor misconduct into political prisoners, they resolved not to tell tournament officials about their suspicions. Instead, they asked FIDE's ethics committee for advice, had Hotchard removed Feller from his last game of the tournament, and convened for deliberations upon returning home. And deliberate they did. The French Chess Federation met on October 11, where Pomian revealed the text outright, evincing Marzolo repeatedly texting Hotchard strings of 10 digits that all followed the same pattern with direct correlation to Feller's games. The first two digits of the numbers were always 06, the next two for the move number, for example 02 denoting the second move of the game. The fifth and sixth were the from square, 71 means seventh file, first rank. The seventh and eighth were the destination square, 63 means sixth file, third rank. The final two were random random and of no importance. You might think this is a clever system, but it's really not at all. This is just international chess notation, common in correspondence, with superfluous digits thrown in. What's more, the Federation figured out how Hotchard gave the moves to Feller. He relayed digits 7 and 8 of the aforesaid strings by standing behind the other players on the team and their opponents, all of whom were ignorant to the scheme. The opponent of MVL was A and 1, the opponent of Fresenet was B and 2, the opponent of Tkachev was C and 3, the opponent of Feller was D and 4, Feller himself was E and 5, Tkachev was F and 6, Fresenet was G in 7, and MVL was H in 8. At this high level of Grandmaster play, knowing the destination square alone is sufficient for the GM to figure out which piece would be strongest there. Further deliberations took place for almost half a year, with even the teammates unearthing new evidence. MVL and Edward made sworn statements that Hotchard admitted the cheating to them during a private lunch in January, while Fresenet submitted independent analysis of Feller's games showing that against Russia, Georgia, and Howell, almost every single move he played aligned with the top move of a popular chess engine at the time, Firebird. His game against Artyom Timofeev, where he won with absurd tactical precision as black by capitalizing on Timofeev's tiniest inaccuracies, is perhaps the most famous example from this ordeal. According to Laurent Verat, Feller and Hotchard briefly confessed to the fraud in October, admitting to cheating in the Olympiads, the Paris Championship, and the Bienn Open. Amusingly, they also claimed at the time they only did so because Marloza pressured them to. However, the two refused to sign any documents unless guaranteed the matter would remain completely confidential. When they realized that wouldn't happen, they stopped cooperating. Regardless, on 19 March 2011, the disciplinary committee 
video, the French Chess Federation suspended Marloza for five years, Feller for three years, plus two years community service with the Federation, and they permanently banned Hotchard from serving as captain or coach. Hotchard and Feller refused to relent and claimed innocence. Hotchard repeatedly insisted the texts were inadmissible under 22615 of the French Penal Code, and Feller fought even more furiously, accusing Pomian of forging the texts herself and trying to throw him to the lions out of ill will. He stated, I completely deny the charges of cheating imposed by the French Chess Federation. This disciplinary proceeding is actually related to the fact that I supported, at the time of the Chess Olympiad, the current president of FIDE in opposition with the current direction of the French Chess Federation. Contrarily, Marlozo seemed resigned to accept his fate. Exactly two months later, on 19 May, Feller and Hotchard had their case for an appeal court accepted, only for their bans as players to be increased to five and three years respectively because the Federation also appealed. But they kept trying, and on 5 June, the first day of the French team championship, Hotchard and Feller started an emergency procedure at the court in Versailles, hoping to suspend the decision at the appeal community and get permission to play on the team. And this time they won. The court in Versailles ruled that the Federation shouldn't have appealed with their executive board, but their ethics board, and the two were able to play again. A convoluted legal mess? Yes, but thankfully FIDE isn't beholden to the caprices of the French legal system and has international reach. So on 7 December, the FF sent the entirety of their proceedings to FIDE to allow their ethics committee to make an informed decision. And it was during these FIDE proceedings where Marzolo, eager to put this behind him and get back to chess, and also aware of how his peers tried to throw him under the bus when the matter was still private, gave a full confession. In two sworn written memorials, he confirmed the entirety of the FF's findings on how the cheating took place, and explained Feller's few losses were due to time pressure and Hotchard messing up the system. He added that he only sunk so low due to his personal financial situation, saying he did it just for money and not for friendship. He also fingered Hotchard as a mastermind of the scheme, stating it was Hotchard who contacted him, obscuring that the services he was paying for would be cheating at first. He confirmed that the trio cheated the same way during the Paris Championship and the Bien tournament, and that after losing against Austria in the Olympiad, both Marzolo and Feller wanted to quit. He concluded by opining that he believes Hotchard groomed the young Feller into cheating and targeted himself due to his financial difficulties, stating that he believed Hotchard would likely be a repeat offender in the future. After seven months of proceedings, FIDE ruled to ban Hotchard from any involvement in chess competitions for 36 months, ban Feller from the same for 33 months, and Marzolo from the same for nine months with an additional nine under probation, being more lenient in honor of his forthcomingness. And although all three are well back to chess now, almost a decade later in 2019, a correctional tribunal in France gave them all suspended sentences of six months in prison, compensated by each paying the French Chess Federation a whopping one euro. Boroslav Ivanov was a 25-year-old FIDE master from Bulgaria who peaked at an ELO of 2342. He also peaked at number one on the chess world's most hated list. Ivanov is a unique entry on this list because he was never caught completely red-handed, but the supplemental and circumstantial evidence against him was so prolific that he became the first person to be banned in the absence of hard evidence. He first gained notoriety at the 2012 International Zadar Open that took place from December 16 to December 22. The tournament had two groups, Open A for those with the FIDE rating above 2300 with a 2200 euro prize and Open B for those with the FIDE rating below 2200 with a 500 euro prize. Those with the FIDE rating between 2200 and 2300 were allowed to choose which group to participate in. Ivanov, a computer programmer, was the only person in that category to choose to compete in Open A, making him the weakest at 2227. Despite that, he finished just half a point behind first place and easily had the highest strength performance, clocking in at 2697, an obscene 470 points higher than his current 2227, which was his highest ever rating. The alarm bells sounded hard before the tournament even finished and not just for his overperformance, but for how he played in individual games. He crushed the 2600 Grandmaster Sarich Ivan with the Sicilian Nidorf. For context, just a year before, he was consistently losing to 1800s when employing the opening. He actually lost two games, but they both indicated cheating. In the first, the game became a closed position, which computers are notoriously weaker at. After 115 moves of perfect play, he was under time pressure, but with a 30 second increment, certainly not enough to justify this blunder. Any master would know that black merely needs to keep the king on d6 to secure the draw, and putting your bishop there instead is one of the few ways to lose. His second loss was even more telling. Before round 8, the tournament organizers made Ivanov empty his pockets, submit his pen, and take off his outer shirt, which was sensationalized by Croatian media into a strip search. Suspecting that his scheme involved a friend watching the live feed and transmitting moves to him, they decided to cut the broadcast before his game. He got summarily routed, having lost the game by move 30 and playing well below the level of a 2000 player. Video analysis by IM Valerie Lilov showed it to be the only game in which his moves didn't match that of the strongest chess computer at the time, Houdini. After the tournament, international media abound, and FIDE Director General Satovsky requested University of Buffalo's Kenneth Regan conduct an independent statistical analysis of Ivanov's performance. On 13 January, Regan released a report stating, for a 2300 player to achieve the high computer correspondence shown in the nine tested games, the odds against are almost a million to one. He continued, the performance is exceptional even for a 2700 player, and virtually unprecedented for an untitled player. In response, Ivanov spoke out for the first time, infamously claiming in an interview with Chessbase on 17 January that his high performance was because he practiced 
practiced a lot with the computer, and after beating Ribka and Houdini by 10-0 each, I was absolute sure that no one was going to stop me winning. That quote is insanity. There's not a single player in the world who could beat either computer 10 times in a row. Still, Ivanov emerged unsanctioned, performed like an amateur in his next tournament, and bounced back to his Super GM level play the tournament after. That prompted 709 players to send an open letter to FIDE on 24 March, imploring them for stricter anti-cheating measures. Undaunted, Ivanov entered and won the second Valgamil Andonov Memorial Rapid Tournament, most notably crushing reigning Bulgarian chess champion Kirill Georgiev. Georgiev noted how unusual it was that Ivanov took the same 5-7 to seven seconds to make every move, no matter how simple or how complicated. Their match became perhaps Ivanov's most scrutinized game in his personal history, thanks in part again to the analysis work of FM Lilov. Immediately after the tournament, 22 Bulgarian GMs and IMs signed a petition that they will not participate in chess tournaments with Ivanov unless special anti-cheating measures are taken. And mere days later, he was banned. For four months, and not actually for cheating. See, Ivanov had something of a history of antisocial behavior towards his peers. He reportedly muttered insults at his opponents, laughed at them if they offered him a draw, accused them of desiring him lasciviously for wanting him to be searched for electronics. The list goes on. But the ban actually only lasted two months, being overturned by the Administrative Court of Sofia. As an extension of goodwill, he agreed to participate in an event by the Bulgarian Chess Federation on 19 June 2013 to clear his name. The event was expensive. It was going to feature a lie detector and chess tests for Ivanov to demonstrate his skill in an environment with no ratings pressure. But on the day of, he didn't show. Standing up the president of the European Chess Union and the Bulgarian Chess Federation, Sovio Denilov, who flew in from Spain. His reason? He claimed he made a last-minute decision to participate in the 7th Varna Open instead. But there was a problem with that. The tournament organizer had stated for weeks that he categorically refused to allow Ivanov to participate, and so he wound up staying home. Ivanov eventually found a tournament willing to take him in October, the Blagov Grid Open in Sofia. Featuring heavy security, electronic jamming units on both sides of the hall, and metal detectors, the open secret was that the tournament organizer had designs for Ivanov to prove his legitimacy. After all, by permitting him to attend, they lost out on 40 or so masters who would have otherwise joined. One master who decided to participate anyway was the visiting GM Maxim Delugi, who was warned by Georgiev to pay close attention to Ivanov. Delugi noted a number of irregularities in Ivanov's play before they were paired up in round 6. Ivanov destroyed his first two opponents with perfect play, then laughed at a draw offer from Saric despite Saric being rated 400 points higher. And finally, he actually resigned in a very obviously drawn position in round 4. In this position, if Black simply plays a2 to advance a pawn, the game is drawn. But at the time, Houdini's engine would incorrectly reflect a 2-point advantage for White, insurmountable in an endgame. He also noted that Ivanov had oversized shoes on and was walking very precariously, almost with a limp, avoiding putting weight on a certain part of his foot. Some described it as a gangsta walk, making this the only time you will ever hear that term in a video about chess. By the time they were paired up, Delugi had privately consulted tech experts and was certain Ivanov was using a device in his shoes to cheat. So Delugi brought one of his friends with him and had him pretend to be his private security personnel. Tournament security was unhappy with the friend's presence, but agreed to the security request as long as both players abided. The friend immediately asked both to remove their shoes. Delugi did so, but Ivanov said, I categorically will not take off my shoes. My socks smell. The arbiter pleaded with Ivanov for minutes to do so, explaining that he would have to be disqualified from the tournament otherwise. But Ivanov refused and gangsta walked out of the tournament. Two days later, Ivanov retired from chess. It was short-lived. He made a brief comeback two months later, only to be confounded twice. Once on December 9 for refusing to allow his shoes to be checked again, and once on December 12 when tournament officials found an electronic device on his back, but he refused to let them see it. He retired permanently after this. The FIDE Ethics Commission briefly opened a case on him, but silently discarded it in lieu of removing him from their ratings history. And finally, the Bulgarian Chess Federation permanently banned him in December of 2013. He wasn't heard of again until March of 2017, when a Bulgarian comedy daily show called Gospodari na Efira, which often did a better job of exposing criminals than actual Bulgarian authorities, confronted him for being the ringleader of a criminal group forging and selling driver's licenses. He wasn't just selling fakes to fellow criminals, he personally constructed a phishing website, a fake website identical to the government's real one to trick innocent civilians into buying his licenses. What a great guy. Before we move on to number one, I want to highlight an important quote from Delugi on Ivanov. It both captures how the smallest of computer assistance is enough for masters, and it's an important insight into how cheaters think. You'll see. He said, When he played this move, knight b7 against Saric, he took 10 seconds. It was a 5 to 10 minute thing, in my modest opinion, since a knight could take on f5 instead. But when he decided in 10 seconds, I was shocked. He doesn't know when to put on the theatrics. You have to be strong enough to do that. If I had this gadget, I would be killing people left and right, and nobody would know. This is the real danger, because if a 2600 player has this thing, he knows exactly how to behave, he knows exactly when to think, and he doesn't need to use it more than four times during a game. That's plenty to destroy anyone. 
If you Google search Salugi's name, you'll get an image of this guy. You already know that's not him. New York Post writer Aaron Keller is apparently facial blind. Who says journalism is dead? This is Delugi. Maxim Delugi is an American grandmaster peaking at an ELO of 2570 who was twice caught cheating online in his early 50s. His case may not be the most sensational on this list, but it is the most contextually poetic. Delugi was caught cheating twice on Chess.com during Title Tuesdays, which you probably remember are prized events. The first time he was caught on 30 April 2017 under the account Delugi, and the second time was almost exactly three years later on 28 April 2020 under the account Maxim Delugi. For his first ban, Delugi was disconnected live before the event's conclusion and immediately shot himself in the foot by jumping into the website's chat to attack staff for accusing him of cheating as a character assassination. Chief Customer Officer Danny Wrench was much more tactful. He refused to discuss it with other users and tried to dissuade public interest. In email correspondence, Delugi eventually decided to be a little more forthcoming, emphasis on little. Writing four months later, it's been a few months and I finally got to the bottom of what happened during the title Tuesday. I was playing on a laptop with a TV screen hooked up to it so the kids in the group I was teaching could follow the moves. They would scream out their suggestions as I was thinking about my moves. I am now positive that one of the kids was using a program on a cell while this was going on. I liked many of his moves, though I had no idea he was using assistance to generate them. Although I don't have direct proof, I am almost certain that that's what actually happened and in this way I was actually getting many strong engine generated moves during the two tournaments in question. I never imagined that the moves of these kids could interfere with fair play as I usually played much weaker with their help than without. I can give you his name if necessary, but I hope it will just stay between us. That line at the end wherein Maxim offers to give the student's name is nothing short of disgusting. This email is designed to draw attention to and sacrifice a minor, his own student no less, to save his own reputation. And the email apparently already had two paragraphs of identifying info on the kid that motherboard had to censor. Anyway, getting outside help at all is cheating, whether it's from a child or a computer, so his place on this list is secured. But I personally find his story unbelievable. Would it really take a grandmaster four months to realize that asking his student for help was the reason his moves were accidentally identical to a computer's, if that's what actually happened? The story is contrived and dishonest. What's more, it's impossible. The games Delugi was detected cheating in were blitz games. Three minute, two second increment. Each player had an average of seconds to move, and Maxim was spitting out his engine identical moves so fast that he had more time remaining on his clock than his opponents. There simply wasn't enough time for him to ask students moves like he claimed he did. Here's GM Hikaru Nakamura, who emerged as a de facto journalist of Delugi's cheating fiasco, saying the same. When people do that it is normally a rapid game it is not in a blitz game in a blitz game where it's three plus two you there's not enough of a break between every single move to do this consistently but wrench was a model of professionalism in reply a week later he extended compassion and diplomatically wrote simply put we do not believe this was the first and only time you broke the rules and we simply cannot move forward with this discussion until you are truly ready to come clean he also reminded delugi that chess.com has never spoken on the matter publicly only delugi had delugi responded with a shorter email that continued to blame the minor and wrench eventually replied to the effect that he's willing to accept that delugi has at least acknowledged committing a violation by getting outside help and give him a second chance account, much like they gave Hans, with a ban on competing in monetary events. When Delugi accepted, Wrench privately expressed relief to his team at the situation's pressure releasing with his halfway confession. For Delugi's second ban, Chess.com evidently reneged on their decision to forbid Delugi from monetary events at some point. Humorously, GM Hikaru Nakamura was streaming the tournament that would see Delugi banned, saying this the moment they were paired up. Um, oh great, I have to play Delugi, okay, lovely. These GMs definitely have a good intuition for who's been caught cheating. Anyway, this time the correspondence was much simpler, likely because Delugi knew how silly it would look to try to contrive an excuse a second time. A mere seven minutes after he received the initial ban email, he admitted he violated the rules as he had some help in some of the games from an outside source, again refusing to admit to directly using a computer. As you guys know from earlier in the video, Chess.com works quite hard to keep these situations private. So why do we know about this? The answer is Delugi got the spotlight shown on him as a mentor of Hans Niemann. I have to say I'm uh, very impressed by uh, Niemann's uh, play uh, and uh, I think uh, his mentor Maxim Delugi must be doing uh, a, great, uh, a great job. At the time of that jab, Magnus Carlsen was still shifting through the legality of what he was allowed to say. Neiman would deny this in his lawsuit, but he attended the Max Academy in New York, and Delugi has definitely provided him significant instruction, so it all comes full circle. The emails were leaked to the press on 28 September 2022, before the Neiman report by Chess.com, and Delugi responded on 10 October, after the Neiman report dropped. I'm not going to dissect his full statement, this video is already too long, but Delugi's response is rife with logical fallacies and falsehoods. First, he poisons the well in his very first line by claiming 
claiming that the emails were leaked because Chess.com has a financial interest in Magnus Carlsen. The rest of the intro is no better, claiming Magnus insinuated Deluli helped Neiman cheat in their match. That just isn't true. Carlsen merely insinuated that the apple didn't fall far from the tree. Humorously, Delugi later claims he orchestrated the capture of infamous cheater Borislav Ivanov, and you already know that in actuality he was just one of many nails in Ivanov's coffin and only drove him away from one event. And this sentence, although to cheat with an actual device, you do need an accomplice who has access to the device with a chess engine running on it, you also need a connection to the device which, given the precautions taken at many of the modern tournaments, especially the Singfield Cup, is not even remotely a possibility. That stood out to me as the biggest lie, and I'm in good company. GM Hikaru Nakamura also pointed out in a review of the entire statement. Wow. Okay, you guys, I am gonna, this is the first time where I'm like wowed by this. This is absolute, complete, and utter rubbish. This is absolute, utter rubbish. When he says there are precautions taken, he is 100% wrong, and I can give you guys a flat out straight example. The sheer notion um, saying that it's not even remotely a possibility is 100% wrong. 100% wrong. Whether I say that, whether Daniel says that, that is not true. That is just not true straight up. Nakamura further opined that the statement is designed to be long, confusing, and misleading to the reader by drowning them with needless information. I agree. As for Delugi addressing his admitted history of cheating, he basically says he doesn't think his first offense, getting help from a student with a computer, was cheating because Magnus did a similar thing in a Lee Chess livestream. As for the second ban, he says he lied when he confessed the second time because, remembering the messages I got back in 2017, I decided that it's best to admit to wrongdoing, and if they ever made this public, I would always be able to prove that I didn't cheat by simply analyzing the game in question. Wow, that's incredible. He does indeed analyze nine of his chess.com games at the end of the document, but I have to observe that investigating yourself for a crime and finding yourself innocent isn't the most compelling discourse in the world. Once Delugi realized this rebuttal fell flat, again thanks in large part to the work of GM Nakamura, he made a Reddit post on 11 October wherein he didn't even broach any of Nakamura's commentary on his cheating, but instead spent half of it personally attacking the character of Hikaru's father. Shockingly, that did little to establish his innocence and only made him look more guilty. After Nakamura responded to it on his live stream the same day, Delugi made another blog post wherein he didn't apologize but said he acted emotionally. He also claimed he only violated fair play in these prize money events by coincidence and he wouldn't ask his students to corroborate his story because most of them are minors. Isn't that funny? Delugi has been silent on the matter since. As an observer, you can either believe one of two things. You can believe that Delugi had the worst luck in the world when one of his students was helping him with a computer, had even worse luck three years later when he was flagged for engine use without using any assistance, that he lied the second time when he admitted to cheating just in the interest of saving time, or you can believe that Delugi is a repeat offender who was caught multiple times by a team that really wishes they didn't have to. I believe the latter, and I hearken back to his quote on Ivanov, where he said, If I had this gadget, I would be killing people left and right and nobody would know. Delugi literally stated that he believes he is smart enough to get away with cheating using computer assistance. That type of lifelong conceit is irrevocable. One can only imagine how a teacher with that mindset who's been caught multiple times might rub off on the minds of his young, impressionable students. You know, when he's not throwing them under the bus to try to save himself. If there's anything to take away from this all, it's that cheating in chess is tragically prolific. Play on Lee Chess or Chess.com long enough under rapid or classic time controls, and you'll eventually find yourself playing against Stockfish. We amateurs like to think of the problem as relegated to online play, but computers are smaller, more easily accessible, and more powerful by the day. The masters of the game are no more immune to temptation than you and I. It probably looks like I stretched the video by including so's and in archives incidents, but they were really for variety. We'd all get bored by guys being found with phones on the toilet ten times in a row. Believe me, Fide's list list of ethics decisions alone is full of incidents with which to make a much longer list. It's saddening. The only way the game is going to survive into the future is by the moral convictions of its best players. And on that front, I actually am optimistic. Chess exploded in popularity during the pandemic, and cheating tends to thrive best when it can find refuge from the spotlight. The more people that pick up the game from emulating their favorite streamer, the more, I believe, will reflect those professionals' commitment to chess's integrity.